Welcome to the Lyceum Institute Colloquium series. These colloquia, comprising a pre-recorded lecture and live question and answer session, invite respected academics and intellectuals to challenge our thinking through their own hard-earned expertise and reflections. This lecture, the second of our series, is provided by Dr. Taylor Patrick O'Neill, Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Mount Mercy University in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Dr. O'Neill is the author of Grace, Predestination, and the Permission of Sin, a Thomistic Analysis, published in 2019 from the Catholic University of America Press. Today, Dr. O'Neill will expound on some of these very themes in his lecture on predestination and the doctrine of sufficient and efficacious grace in St. Thomas Aquinas. Hello, this is Taylor Patrick O'Neill, and today I'm going to be talking about um, predestination and the doctrine of sufficient and efficacious grace um, and human freedom, um, especially uh, how these uh, ideas are understood within the mind of St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, So um, in order to get to um, discussing the doctrine of grace and the doctrine of free will, um, especially the relation to prov- uh, providence and predestination, we have to do a little bit of um, background on Thomas's uh, view on providence and predestination. Um, we could spend, um, you know, someone could spend a lifetime doing that. So I'm going to go through sort of as briefly as I, I can, I think, um, simply to highlight uh, the major important principles of what Thomas highlights in his view on providence and predestination and then how that relates to um, his doctrine of grace and uh, human free action. Um, so for, for St. Thomas, um, his, his doctrine of predestination flows out of the antecedent doctrine of um, uh, providence. And so even say in the Summa Theologiae, uh, he will treat uh, predestination immediately after he treats providence. So um, in the Prima Pars, question 22 is on providence, and um, question 23 is on predestination. So Thomas says that predestination, which he divides into election and reprobation, that these are these constitute a certain part of divine providence. Well, what does Thomas mean by providence? Well, um, providence, obviously, Thomas means the governance of the, the created order, um, how does Thomas understand providence? Well, for Thomas, providence is infallibly executed. However, um, it is not executed all in the same way. In other words, um, if we go back to the very um, beginning of the Prima Pars, St. Thomas, of course, gives us his arguments for the existence of God. And those arguments are, I think, really important not just because they demonstrate via unaided reason the existence of God, but they also tell us, of course, quite a bit about the nature of, of, of God, or at least about the kinds of things that we can't predicate of God, um, imperfections and, and things of that sort. So via unaided reason, um, and of course also via faith, we, we know that God is the explanation behind the existence of uh, the created order of the universe. So um, God is essentially uh, the answer to the question, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Um, That God is the fundamental source of both uh, existence uh, in regard to causality and he is also the singular source in regard to uh, motion, change, um, coming to be, the movements from potency to act. So God is the fundamental explanation behind all of that, but God is also radically simple and God is radically omnipotent, right? So drawing those conclusions in, St. Thomas says that, of course, then, that God is not passive to what happens in the created order, but God is its 
its causer and its its mover um and uh that causation and, and movement are not things that just take place at a certain point in antecedent point in time but that god is constantly the source of the universe as it exists in every moment right and this is all you know sort of basic i'm sure you, you're all familiar with this um so saint thomas then um, is going to apply these things to providence and say that because of the fact that the universe is constantly contingent and utterly contingent upon God, this means that the providential ordering of the universe is takes place infallibly. In other words, the divine will is not frustrated by the cosmos which uh, the divine will governs over. Um, that everything which takes place is ultimately explainable because of the working of the divine will. And so it's impossible to sort of carve out some space, if you will, where things are being and causing, but which have no relation to God, or which are not sort of plugged in and hooked up, if you will, to God and his causality and uh, his, his odd extra emotion. So, um, however, St. Thomas is very careful to indicate that the infallibility of providence is not the same thing as saying that what happens happens with necessity and so saint thomas says that certain parts or portions of uh, providence are executed with necessity and certain portions are executed with contingency not contingency in relation to whether what God wills comes about, but contingency in relation to the thing that is happening. Um, okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, what St. Thomas um, begins to articulate is that um, we should make a distinction between something that happens uh, necessarily and something that happens infallibly but contingently. So, um, if someone holds up a, uh, a stone, for example, given the kind of universe that we've got, um, of course, everything to a certain extent is contingent upon God creating the kind of universe that we've got. But given the kind of universe that we've got, if I'm standing on top of a building and I drop a stone, the stone is going to fall towards the center of the earth, right? It's going to fall towards the ground. Um, that doesn't happen with any contingency. Once I've left the stone, you know, the drop the stone from my hand, and the stone is now sort of in midair for that uh, that immaterial moment or that, that one second or that millisecond or whatever, is going to infallibly and necessarily fall. It has no other option, right? So St. Thomas is uh, saying that there's all sorts of things that happen like that in the universe, right? And this is where um, we get, you know, scientists can speak about um, laws that govern the universe is these laws always these laws always are followed um, of course moral law and the free actions of creatures are not quite like that right um, and so for thomas what's really crucial then in distinguishing contingent from necessary things is whether the events that we are speaking about retains potencies for other possible outcomes so if i drop a stone the stone is going to fall and the stone is going to um, fall necessarily it doesn't really have a whole lot of other uh, potencies now maybe if some other thing uh, some other actor comes into play a bird swoops in and grabs the stone while it's falling okay but in and of itself on its own the stone has no other possibilities no other potencies it's going to fall okay now um when we're talking about a free action, real free choice, um, it will be the case that I will end up, let's say I'm in a position where I have three options. If uh, I'm in a position where I have three options, let's say my position is that I'm going to visit a friend and it's the summertime and so I can choose to visit my friend. I have sort of three separate uh, times during my summer where I can visit them, where my schedule is open. And I can, so I can visit them during June, I can visit them during July, or I can visit them during August. I'm going to end up um, uh, inclining myself towards one of those and only executing one of those options. Again, provided something else doesn't happen, I don't get sick and not go at all or something. But 
Um, I'm going to end up choosing one of those three. However, when I go, say, in July, um, I really had the possibility of going in June or in August. And so, though I am going to end up only bringing one of those potencies into ACT, nevertheless, those other potencies were real potencies, and I made a real decision to choose just this one particular action among other options. For St. Thomas, that's crucial in understanding the distinction between something that happens with necessity and something that happens with contingency. So now, what St. Thomas says is that providence being infallible leaves open the possibility for God to do all sorts of things or to govern all sorts of things to happen, but in a way which does not transgress the contingent nature of those events. One of the things which is always intrinsically and of its nature contingent are free actions. And that's what it means for an action to be free, right? That it's contingent, that it could have been otherwise. Um, and so I am part of the motion, part of the decision-making process, part of the cause of my, say, going and visiting a friend in July rather than June or August. Okay, so if God in his providential ordering of the universe, ordains as part of the full picture of the universe that I will visit my friend in July. That ordination, that movement of providence, will necessarily come about because of the omnipotence and the simplicity of the divine will, because God is providentially uh, exhaustively ordering all things, not just some things here and there, right? He's not another actor within this play of the cosmos, but he's the, he's the narrator. He's the writer behind the entirety of it. Um, but my going or my, uh, yeah. So my going in July, my obeying, if you will, of the divine providence is only a kind of conditional necessity. It's not a real and absolute necessity. In other words, my going and visiting a friend in July comes about in such a way that, yes, God has willed it, and to a certain extent, I am doing it because God has willed it, but I'm participating in the um, execution of the divine providence and in such a way that I really could have chosen otherwise, at least in regard to the intrinsic possibility of my actions. So, um, what people mean when they say, well, if, if it's infallible, how could it have happened otherwise? Um, I think St. Thomas's answer to that would be, there's two different kinds of um, necessity or infallibility that we could talk about. Um, we've already talked about strict or absolute necessity. Then there's a conditional necessity. So, based upon the condition that God wills that I freely choose to visit my friend in July... Of course, it's going to happen that I freely choose to visit my friend in July. But what's important is that nothing in that divine movement has changed um, the fact that I had the potency to do otherwise, nor is the movement moving me in a manner which is necessary. In other words, which takes away those potencies that I have to have done otherwise. So in other words, St. Thomas says very simply, God ordains and governs via providence, but in some ways via a necessity or necessary motions, and in some ways via contingent motions. So um, he talks all about these two different kinds of necessity, and only one of them is a true necessity, right? So one of his stock examples is if Socrates is uh, sitting, then Socrates is necessarily sitting while he sits. In other words, there's a kind of necessity based upon a, a condition based upon an antecedent if it's the case that Socrates is sitting well then yes in that particular circumstance he's going to necessarily be sitting but he retains a potency to have been standing he retains a potency to stand at any moment that he's sitting um, and so that's quite different of course from say um, someone who is uh, injured and is unable to stand. Socrates may be sitting just next to this fellow who's, who's injured, but there is a real difference between their sitting um, 
with a potency to be standing or without a potency to be standing. So though they both sort of end up in the same place, if you will, how they got there, how they remain there is quite different. Only one can be freely chosen and thus only one is contingent even if both are sitting by a kind of ordination of uh, divine providence. So, okay, so setting that up then, predestination for Thomas is really just an extension of this idea, okay? Um, for St. Thomas, predestination is a kind of coming together, if you will, of um, what we just established about providence with the notion that predestination is an election is a movement toward something which is wholly above human nature. That is the beatific vision, participating in um, the divine nature, right? going infinitely beyond even human nature, not to mention the fact that human nature um, is already harmed. So we're making sort of the redemptive step to go from wounded nature to more integral nature, like with Adam and Eve, and then we're going sort of infinitely beyond that in sanctification, deification, um, uh, beatitude, whatever you want to call it, by sharing in the divine nature, sort of becoming incorporated, not just in human society and human love, but becoming incorporated into the divine society of divine love of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. So that participation requires divine grace. Um, now, that's not just because God is sort of wanting to close off the possibility of, um, of heaven, of the beatific vision, um, unless we receive something from him. It's a kind of logical necessity. What grace is, is a kind of receiving of the divine life into the soul of uh, the, the created being. Um, and so, as, as many Thomists, sort of spiritual, mystical theologians have said in the past, the beginning of grace in the souls, grace, especially sanctifying grace, um, and then especially uh, the theological virtues and charity especially, um, that these are not sort of like hoops to jump through in order to enter into heaven, but these are the, the, the seed of heaven already existing within the soul. And so once that seed sort of blossoms and we have a fullness of um, the grace of the divine life, a fullness of charity, that just is heaven, right? Um, okay. Now, uh, everything then, because going back to what we've said about the, the, the five ways, God is the source of everything. God is the source of all being. God is the source of all goodness. God is the source of all beauty, etc. Because of that, man can do nothing apart from God, right? So, Thomas is, 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 um, gives, I think, a really um, helpful analogy, or not even an analogy, but I guess just an illustration, when he says that um, what that means, in, in a certain sense, what it means for God to be God and for us to be uh, humans, is that the way that we understand love is almost sort of in an inverse order. Uh, what does he mean by that? Uh, he says... Um, that normally in humans, in our sort of experiential uh, uh, lives, something is good. We perceive something to be good. The senses perceive it to be good. The intellect perceives it to be good, etc. And this elicits in us a love, right? We love that which we perceived to be good. Um, and indeed, we can't, as St. Augustine says, we can't know, we can't love something unless we first know it. And we know it as a good, or at least we perceive it as a good. With God, the order is reversed, um, and necessarily reversed. If God is not passive to anything in the created order, but if God is the sustainer, the creator, the source of all that is, pure act, right, pure existence, then if something is good, it must be the case that it's good because it is antecedently loved by God. And the love of God is the cause of goodness in creation, and even in created, freely acting creatures, right? So <clears throat> if I see a flower, its goodness is irrespective of me. Um, its goodness is something that I'm passive to. I merely recognize it, and that elicits a love for the flower in me, an appreciation of its beauty, um, whatever, 
But it's the exact opposite in God, right? There is no beauty or goodness within the creature, within anything, within the flower, whatever, unless God gives his own beauty or truth or goodness, gives his own being to that thing and makes it lovable. Yeah. So if that's the case, then it must be true that all men who are to be saved are antecedently loved by God and willed and ordered towards their salvation, their sanctification. And that everything that happens within the life of the saints, within the life of the saved, all the good actions that they produce, that they participate in, all the virtues that they accumulate, all of those things are the fruit, the effect of this antecedent love of God that is constantly in every moment of their lives, ordering them, inclining them, moving them closer and closer towards their teleological end, right? Towards their supernatural end of beatitude. I think a helpful articulation of this can be found in uh, Summa Contra Gentiles 3, um, 163. I'll just read this little brief point here. Um, here Thomas says, Moreover, that predestination and election do not find their cause in any human merits can be made clear. So Thomas here and elsewhere is trying to establish the point that election is absolutely antecedent to all good actions. All merits, all virtue, all actual graces, etc. That all of those things flow first from uh, this idea of election and predestination, because that is the beginning of the love of God for the creature that is going to carry through, carry it through all the way through to salvation and uh, sanctification. Okay, so it isn't that God is sort of passively looking out and seeing who is going to merit eternal salvation, and then he elects them. That kind of election is passive and non-causal. In fact, the merits then would be causal of what God is doing with the soul, and thus, we would be falling into a kind of um, Pelagianism or semi-Pelagianism, wherein some good that we have is uh, antecedent to God's will, antecedent to God's goodness, and which God is merely passive to. Um, Gergou Lagrange has this line. Um, he says, at the end of the day, we either have to come down to either God is uh, determining or God is determined Right. And another way of putting it is that God is either passive to some goodness in us or that God is not. And God is absolutely the source, uh, actively the source of all goodness that's in us. OK, so merits, so foreseen merits cannot be the cause of predestination and election. Uh, St. Thomas says, not only from the fact that God's grace, which is the effect of predestination, is not preceded by merits, but rather precedes all human merits, as we showed. But it can also be shown from this, that the divine will and providence is the first cause of things that are done, but that there can be no cause of the divine will and providence, although among the effects of providence. So it's that which is always primary. Providence, the divine will, the divine love. Okay. All right. So. From there, then, of course, St. Thomas is not a universalist. We could, you know, again, you could spend hours and hours and hours on, on figuring out why that is. But for now, we'll just take it as a given that St. Thomas believes um, primarily from a, uh, I think, the faith in uh, Revelation and faith in the church's interpretation of Revelation that not all souls are saved. Okay, so from there, then, St. Thomas makes a distinction and says that some souls are elect, some souls are predestined, and some souls are given up to reprobation. Um, now, St. Thomas is careful, and this becomes even more articulated and sussed out over the course of the Thomistic commentatorial tradition over the next you know, centuries, numerous centuries. Um, but St. Thomas is careful to distinguish between election and reprobation he does not maintain that the difference between election and reprobation is that election is a kind of movement towards heaven and that reprobation is a movement towards hell. This, is, this might seem like a subtle distinction, but it's actually a really crucial distinction, especially in um, understanding the difference between uh, 
um, a Thomistic understanding of predestination and a Calvinistic or a Jansenistic understanding of predestination. So Thomas says, exclu- uh, says um, uh, uh, explicitly um, in, uh, let's see, where is this? I have a quote here. This is in Prima Pars 23, uh, Article 3, Odd 2. He says ex- uh, explicitly, reprobation differs in its causality from predestination. This latter predestination is the cause of both what is expected in the future life by the predestined, namely glory, and of what is received in this life, namely grace. But reprobation is not the cause of what's in the present, which is sin, nor is reprobation the cause of where the, uh, uh, the reprobated soul ends up, which is hell. It's not the cause of damnation. Okay, well, why is that? Well, uh, uh, for Thomas, reprobation is not a a movement or an inclination towards sinful actions, nor is it a movement or an inclination towards disobeying God, rebelling against God, um, and and, and, um, um, meriting or demeriting, rather, uh, damnation at the end of all things. Reprobation is not a mirror motion in the opposite direction. Reprobation is a... um, a permission of defect in the uh, sinful creature. So it doesn't um, in it doesn't put anything into the created creature, which uh, makes it sin. Nor does it take something away from the creature, which um, without which it um, cannot help but to sin. It is merely a not giving of the uh, graces which will efficaciously and infallibly lead to salvation. Now, um, it should be stated that in both of these cases, so in the case of election and in the case of reprobation, um, these are both portions or, or constitutive of the providential ordering of things. And these are both part of the providential order of things that we've already talked about, which is a contingent ordering. Um, so, just as the 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 the, the saved creature um, receives grace to do a particular good action, some actual grace, which of course even um, someone who's not saved can can and does receive all sorts of actual graces. Saint Thomas says every single person saved or not receives. Uh, infinitely more grace than uh, they are owed, um, and and probably much, much, much more than we could ever imagine until we see all things at the end um, in their completeness. But in either case, the soul which is um, which is being moved by grace to perform a good action remains free for precisely the same reason that God is able via his providence to ordain things infallibly but contingently. So the free creature which is moved by grace to freely cooperate in doing some good action, they retain the potency to have done otherwise. They retain the potency to have done a different kind of action. They retain the potency to have not acted at all. They retain the potency to, um, now, a potency for not acting is, of course, you know, talk about potencies in, in different ways. But the possibility of not acting at all, they retained a potency for um, performing an action which would be warped by sin rather than an action which is uh, ordained towards the good. And the same thing then must be said of the sinner. The sinner is going to receive a grace, which is, they're going to receive graces throughout their life, which are sufficient for their having chosen better, which is really just another way of saying that just like the person who's acting well, the person who acts poorly has potencies to have done otherwise. They have real potencies to have done otherwise. So um, how does this relate to grace? Well, St. Thomas then um, says that Uh, in relation to grace and providence and predestination and reprobation, that all souls uh, receive a... uh, All souls are uh, antecedently or in a certain sense willed to be saved by God. And that God provides ample graces for every soul to be saved. Um, Again, 
he explicitly states that reprobation does not take anything away from the power of the person reprobated. Um, meaning that it is not as if God is withholding the grace which gives the real potency, the real possibility, the real power for salvation. He's not. If he were, if he were, and we were to say be talking about an actual um, necessary and infallible motion towards the evil, that would preclude the possibility of having chosen otherwise, right? Um, it would be sort of moving a sinner in such a way that they have only one option, and that is to sin. And St. Thomas says, if that were the case, you would not be able to justly punish someone who does not have free choice. It is free choice, which is the very basis for just punishment. Okay, And this is, of course, why um, the church has c- continually condemned um, the views of, of Calvin and, and uh, Cornelius uh, Jansen. Um, because they do not, they, their, their motion, their understanding of reprobation is not, um, the very least we'll say it doesn't adequately distinguish uh, or distance uh, God from the sinful will of the reprobated soul and seems to imply that it's a bit more of a causal or directly influential motion that's imparted to the sinner to sin rather than simply a, um, uh, a nothing. A, a non-movement, uh, as St. Thomas talks about it. So reprobation takes nothing away from the power of the person that is reprobated. And he says, hence, when it is said that the reprobated cannot obtain grace, this must not be understood as implying absolute impossibility. They retain the real potency, right? But only a conditional impossibility. So given the fact that God is not infallibly, yet contingently, moving the creature to perform X good action, which will eventually lead to um, penance and salvation, it will happen. It will happen, but only by a condition. It will happen that the uh, creaturely will, will will fall and will choose sin, even though it retained the potency to choose good, and it ret- retained even, uh, it's, it's given a sort of sufficient grace to have elevated itself above sin and not to fall. Okay. Um, so he says uh, that the predestined must, uh, so, uh, sorry, let's see. Um, where was I? Hence it, when it was said, or when it is said that the reprobated cannot obtain grace, this must not be understood as implying absolute impossibility, uh, but only conditional impossibility. Uh, as was said above, that the predestined must necessarily be saved. Yet a conditional necessity which does not do away with the liberty of choice. Whence, although anyone reprobated by God cannot acquire grace, and what he means there again is this conditional necessity, not a real full necessity. Uh, What he means is that they have the ability to act in a graced manner, but they will not. Nevertheless, that he falls into this or that particular sin comes from the use of his free will. Hence, it is rightly imputed to him as guilt. In other words, when St. Thomas talks about sin, St. Thomas says there's nothing in a sinful action which is at all attributable to God because a sinful action is an action with a kind of defect. And defects arise within the secondary cause of the action. So if God moves me to do X, but I impede that motion to do X, then I'm the cause of the fact that I have not uh, done X right? Um, the defect lies entirely within the secondary cause and does not, there's nothing about the defect which comes from the primary cause, which is God. There's nothing given, nor is there not, nor is there anything withheld that requires that X come about. So to sort of give a, a very brief summary, and, and we can uh, discuss this more in the, the Q&A uh, session, to put a very brief uh, sort of cap on it. Um, God orders things in the universe via providence, and God, uh, predestination, uh, which is election and reprobation, are part of God's providential ordering of things. Election is something positive. Election is a kind of antecedent love, an antecedent election in the saved, or those who will be saved, 
which is the cause of everything that makes them lovable and good and thus meritorious for the beatific vision throughout their lives. Reprobation, on the other hand, is not anything positive. It's merely a not giving of that election. And in either case, that which results, virtue and good actions uh, on the one hand, and sinful actions and disobedience um, and hatred for God on the other, that both of these will follow infallibly from whether a person is elect or not, but they do not follow necessarily. The actions are completely contingent, such that we can really say that those who are saved had the true possibility to have sinned and to have rejected God, and yet didn't, and thus they freely chose it, and thus they can truly, in a certain sense, merit heaven. And those who demerit, and those who demerit or merit damnation or hell, they had the real possibility to um, have participated with grace and to have become uh, meritorious of heaven, but they freely chose not to do so. And so in both cases, the end result is the effect of a creature's free choosing. Um, and free, cho free choosing means... Um, the possibility, the power of, of other options, but settling on one. And that means real contingency, which precludes any kind of necessity. So um, that's, again, a very sort of broad overview of what St. Thomas has to say. What it is, um, what we'll sort of wrap up with here then is, where do we get then the, uh, this distinction of uh, sufficient and efficacious grace? Uh, a lot has been made about this distinction. Um, usually the objections to Thomas's position on this, especially the objections uh, which are rooted in a concern that this doctrine of predestination and reprobation does not provide real possibility and thus real freedom in regard to where the soul ends up, if you will. Uh, a lot of those objections are rooted in... Um, objections to the very distinction of sufficient sufficient and efficacious grace. And so um, there's been a kind of a um, uh, an argument that's been fairly ubiquitous, I would say, at least over the last 100 uh, years, but you find it even earlier than that, um, which is that this is not actually what I've just outlined. It's not actually Thomas's position, um, and that uh, this is evidenced by the fact that Thomas never uses the term sufficient and efficacious grace. Um, I've tried to argue um, that that's only true in a certain sense. So it's true that Thomas doesn't um, sort of say, well, there are two kinds of grace. There's sufficient grace or efficacious grace. So there's two ways of understanding grace. And here they are, and here's the distinction. Here's what they mean. Uh, that's true. St. Thomas does, however, in numerous places, um, speak about graces which are sufficient and graces which are efficacious. Graces, graces which are sufficient for X, and graces which are efficacious for X. He also uh, makes the distinction between graces which give the potency, the power, the ability for X, and then further graces which bring about the actuality of X, uh, bring about the real uh, event of X. Um, and so that's really just uh, sort of implicitly, uh, not even that implicitly, the distinction between sufficient and efficacious grace. So that distinction then becomes a little bit more explicit and a little bit more um, properly uh, refined in um, Domingo Bañez, a Renaissance-era uh, Thomistic commentator. Um, and then it's really, especially amongst uh, English and uh, French-speaking Catholics, it's um, become quite prominent in association with uh, Gergut Lagrange. Um, both because, you know, he's someone that just died in, in 1964 and because his he was so prolific in his writings um, and so much of it is available. Uh, he's kind of probably the most um, accessible of the Thomistic commentators, uh, especially the, 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 the more traditional Dominican uh, Thomistic commentators. Um, so briefly then, the idea that sufficient grace and efficacious grace um, 
the idea behind the distinction, uh, rather, is simply um, taking what is implicitly there in Thomas, taking some of the things that we already mentioned, and giving these things a name. So sufficient grace is really just a way of describing the fact that God, that reprobation does not take anything away, does not remove anything from the power of the reprobated soul by which they may merit heaven. Now, if meriting heaven can only happen with grace, which we've already said, then for the reprobated soul to really have the potency, the power to have merited heaven, to have participated with God and, um, and earn salvation, then it must be the case that all souls, the elect and the reprobate, receive grace, which provides the power, the potency to have acted above fallen human nature and begun to incline themselves toward God. Um, in other words, a grace which is sufficient for salvation, but not necessarily efficacious. Uh, efficacious grace, then, is grace which doesn't just provide the power and the potency, but grace which actually brings about the um, particular potency. Um, in other words, reduces that potency to act. Um, so Gerard de Lagrange, for example, the way he describes the, the distinction between sufficient and efficacious grace is that it's really just the uh, distinction between uh, potency and act as applied to grace. Uh, that's really all it is. Um, so one of the... Um, well, before before we get there, let me just add then briefly that... So um, what Bañez and Gerard de Lagrange uh, say then is that um, every soul receives sufficient grace for salvation... Um, only the elect receive grace, which is efficacious for salvation. Um, okay. One of the misunderstandings about this distinction um, is that these are two different graces. Um, as if God sort of uh, gives to some people efficacious graces and God gives to other people sufficient graces. Um which is not, uh, so, so that's not an accurate understanding of the distinction. Um, and, and why that is, I think, can especially be understood if we go back to thinking about it simply as potency and act as applied to, uh, to grace. Um, no one, there, there's no such thing as potencies uh, which are all alone, if you will, right? Potencies always... Um, in here in something which is in act. Um, so there are, it's not like there's just potencies floating around out there. Um, potencies are always uh, rooted in something which is actual, something which is existing. So the same thing is true about sufficient to efficacious grace. There's really only, if we're thinking about grace in, in, in regard to like what God gives out to people, there's really only efficacious grace. Efficacious grace is grace that brings about some good. Now, it might be sanctifying grace, and so it brings about justification, and it brings about the beginning of sanctification. Um, it might be an actual grace, which is just ordered towards bringing, uh, e effecting some particular good action. In either case, though, all grace is efficacious for something. There's no grace that's just given that's, um, that's inefficacious. Uh, all grace is efficacious for something. So what sufficient grace means then, sufficient grace is merely uh, referring to the potencies which come along with having received a particular efficacious grace. So the stock example of this is that if someone receives a, um, uh, an efficacious grace to be uh, contrite for their sins, that that will bring with it a potency towards a further good action, which is, say, to go to confession. Um, now, going to confession is itself a separate action from just the mere contrition, right? You can be contrite and yet end up not going to confession. Um, so that further action of going to confession is going to require a further grace, a further actual grace. But that further actual grace is not necessary to have the potency, to have the ability to go to confession, that that is a kind of potency which is made available, a power, a possibility which becomes a real possibility for a creature 
when it becomes contrite about its sins. So sufficient graces are really just a way of speaking about the potencies and possibilities that come along with the, 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 the real, if you want to put it that way, the ontologically real or the efficacious graces which God does give to us. And so St. Thomas and, and Banyas and Gergu are arguing that every single person, elect or not, receives plenty of efficacious graces, and every single person is guaranteed to receive uh, the efficacious graces which bring with them sufficient graces, uh, sufficient for um, salvation, even if salvation doesn't actually come about. Um, St. Thomas also makes use of the distinction between um, uh, the antecedent and consequent will of God, I don't want to get too far into that, but um, just briefly, St. Thomas uh, maintains, uh, he actually gets this from uh, St. John Damascene, um, that God does have a real desire for the salvation of all. You couldn't state that if at the same time there were creatures that had no ability to be saved, right? You, you, would, you, you couldn't say that God in any way loves them or that God in any way wishes for their salvation, so it must be the case that everyone has the real power to be saved. Um, nevertheless, God does permit that some creatures will freely choose to reject him. Okay? Um, if a soul is <clears throat> um, not going to be maintained in a certain perfection, then that soul is going to, of its own accord, freely choose to fall into some imperfection. Um, so antecedently, or sort of looked at all on its own, God wishes the salvation of, of all, uh, of all uh, men. However, consequently, in eye towards the whole of the created order, God does permit certain creatures to both have a power, have a potency to go to heaven, but permits that they actually will choose not to do so. Um, why does he do that? Um, and then, then we really start getting into some mystical contemplative stuff. But um, essentially, Thomas says that uh, God never permits any evil to be done unless it brings about some greater good. Uh, if it's the case, if it's the case that all goodness comes from God, then at least uh, uh, theoretically, we could say uh, for now, uh, that... Um, God could stop some evil that does happen, right? It's not like God is, again, God is not passive. God is not um, impotent in regard to what happens within the, the ordering of the universe. Um, and yet, God doesn't just stop every single possible evil uh, action that could happen. He doesn't move every single free creature to every single good action or refrain from every single bad action that it could perform. Um, why is that? Well, to some extent, of course, it's going to be a mystery, uh, at least until we can see all things. But Thomas's sort of final uh, answer there is that, um, is that uh, it couldn't be the case or God wouldn't permit some sort of smaller evil unless there was a greater evil that was coming out of it. So um, there's a lot to <laughs> soak in there. Um, hopefully what I've said at least uh, makes some sense and follows. So what we said about providence, how that applies to predestination, and then how what we said about predestination and reprobation um, <clears throat> is kind of a coming together of Thomas's understanding of providence and Thomas's understanding of grace and uh, salvation and sanctification. Um, so that sort of sets us up, I hope, for um, a number of possible questions and uh, conversations in the Q&A session. Um, I think that there's a lot more to be said then, of course, about sufficient and efficacious grace and these two different kinds of uh, necessities and the difference between necessity and contingency. Um, but hopefully we at least have the, the, uh, the foundation laid so that we can engage in a conversation on that. Um, so thank you so much for listening. I'm looking forward to engaging uh, with those of you who are able to make it to the Q&A session.